Today the tutorial uh, will be taught um, jointly by myself and uh, Maria Wimmer uh, from University of Koblenz Landau. Uh, the material uh, was prepared, uh, my part of the material was prepared in collaboration with Adek Boyega Ojo and Elsa Esteves from uh, UNU in Macau. Um, so um, th th this tutorial is a response of um, um, a pressure uh, for governments to show that ICT investment uh, is actually producing concrete public value, that ICT and electronic government is contributing to, in a concrete way to, uh, to development, to development objectives, and we'd like to uh, and to policy uh, um, goals by government, and we would like to choose sustainable development as a case of an, um, a, goal, uh, a policy uh, and see how electronic government can contribute. So the, the, the purpose of the uh, tutorial is to propose and demonstrate the concept of electronic governance for sustainable development. Arguably, the, this concept is not well understood, is not standard uh, and is just emerging. So what do we understand by electronic government in the uh, uh, deployed in the pursuit of public goals and in the pursuit of sustainable development in particular. Um, we will explore how eGov can advance the, the, the various dimensions of sustainable development, social, environmental, economic and transitional uh, sustainability and, um, and that's the part where Maria will be teaching, will take over, we will explain how open government and policy development can help realize EGOF for SD concept. So from now on I will talk about electronic governance as EGOF and electronic governance for sustainable development as EGOF for SD. Okay, so uh, in line with this aim, uh, the, the talk, uh, the, the tutorial is structured into um, four parts, electronic governance, electronic governance for development, and electronic governance for sustainable development before moving to realizing the EGOF concept with open government and, and policy modeling and development framework. So that's the plan for the next two hours. Uh, Maria will expand the, the agenda for the, for the last topic in, in her presentation. So let me start with a very broad context for, for electronic government in general. And the context is the pressure that governments around the world are under uh, from globalization, from fiscal demands, from evolving societies, from raising citizen expectations. Governments are expected to be responsive to social change, to address public concerns, to de uh, deliver effective government programs, to manage public funds efficiently, to implement the principles of good governance, etc., etc. In short, governments are expected to produce public value. Okay. Um, at the same time, we see a, a number of opportunities being created by the progress in, in, uh, um, in technologies, in information technologies and internet. So whether we talk about Web 2.0, and its various manifestations like RSS, blogs, wikis, social networking, mashups, uh, virtual worlds, or when we talk about semantic web or cloud computing or uh, software service, global uh, digital identity, ubiquitous computing. Uh, by the way, it's true, we tested yesterday that here in Tallinn, broadband is everywhere. Well, at least we couldn't refute the claim that uh, we have a ubiquitous broadband here. Uh, ambient service pervasive uh, broadband. So um, th this progress creates opportunities for government in particular to address the pressures. So in response to the pressures and utilizing the, the technological progress, governments are innovating. They are innovating uh, in terms of the development of infocom infrastructures, in terms of reuse of public information, citizen-centric practice, one service space, this is from Estonia, public, private and voluntary sector services come together into one space, etc. And it, this innovation in turn results in fundamentally new ways, new paradigms of public administration and governance uh, like collaborative government, participatory government, mobile government, agile government, the 
local e-government, so the, the shift from national down to provincial and local level e-government to deliver concrete benefits to people, and the, the two manifestations of e-gov in the development and in the sustainable development concept. Okay? So pressure on governments, technological progress, innovations, and how it helps to utilize technology in response to the pressures, and fundamentally new ways for public administrations to operate and to relate with, the, with various stakeholders um, uh, enabled by technology. So um, this creates a kind of broad uh, context for understanding what is electronic governance. There is no single definition. Various definitions are still contested. Here I put four definitions. Some uh, define eGov as uh, basically government online. Others will talk about all kinds of ICT applications, whether front or back office by government. And other definitions will talk about transformation. transformation if of the internal working of government or transformation of the interactions or relationships between government and citizens, government and businesses, government and government. Okay? So we, we, for, for the purpose of this tutorial, we, uh, we will adopt the last, uh, the transformational definition that looks broadly not only at the internal working of government but also at the, at the interaction with, uh, with the public. Now you can also, and th these definitions can be nicely actually placed at the intersection of the administrative system, political system, and civil society, and how they actually intersect. So depending on the, on the assumed definition, the, the, the different aspects of these three domains will be taken into account. And also, um, the EGOF is not a discipline, and it probably will never be a discipline. It's a problem domain and to which many disciplines can contribute. So you see a, a number of possible contributions from informatics, from political science, public administration science, economics, management, sociology. And depending on the definition chosen, the contri disciplinary contributions can happen in various ways. So the, this also shows a, a possible... Um, uh, a contribution by different disciplines. Now, if we kind of deconstruct this, the, the, our, our working definitions of electronic governance into something more systematic like EGOF determines how government applies technology to transform itself and its interactions with customers in order to create impact on the society. Then, then from this, we can see that there are clear five dimensions. So we can deconstruct these definitions and identify five dimensions of government, technology, interaction, customers, and society, and within each dimension, a number of variables, which by themselves can be uh, uh, refined into concrete indicators to actually measure progress in these areas. So uh, government, mission, role, values, technology, like equipment, infrastructure, data, interaction, channels, interoperability, governance, uh, customers, um, information needs, uh, producer, consumer roles, accessibility, trust, society, demography, digital inclusion, social tension, participation, and others. So it's possible to kind of uh, um, construct the domain along certain dimensions, just looking at the definition and then trying, and this is very important for us, because in this tutorial we're looking at two domains, EGOF on the one hand and SD on the other hand. So the question is whether there is a systematic way to actually look at both domains and try to define a mapping, to define a relationship. Uh, beyond just showing examples of what is possible with EGOF4D, but at systematically looking at the nature of these two domains and trying to deconstruct uh, the, the definition to come up with dimensions, variables, etc. So this is what the tutorial effectively will, um, will present for you. So, at the same time, um, despite a rather uh, a short life, maybe we can talk about 15 years for electronic government, uh, a short history, we have seen also a change in focus. So, uh, a, a very obvious kind of shift has been from the technical to organizational to societal focus. And let me just walk through these uh, uh, three uh, areas uh, briefly, focal areas briefly. So, at the beginning of electronic governance and in many places until today, the focus is technical and technological. The goals 
are to establish government websites, to publish government information online, to provide online access to public services, to auto uh, automate and optimize administrative processes. Uh, the, the, the corresponding challenges are, are technical. Providing connectivity, assuring interoperability between systems, connecting legacy systems to other systems and the internet and others. But we also understand today that this technological perspective has severe Im limitations. So technology issues are not isolated. Uh, the context, organizational and even broader societal context is very important for understanding how technology should be deployed. Over-reliance on technology is a typical source of failure. Developing more mature services, transactional services, connecting agencies together draws us immediately into organizational issues. And techno technological development alone really does not produce public value, does not directly result in public value. So the focus has shifted uh, to organizational and transformational issues, the objectives being to transform the internal working of agencies using technology, to establish collaboration between agencies and across the whole government, whole of government arrangements, and to offer seamless transactional services through multiple uh, delivery channels, traditional and electronic. The challenges uh, refer to typical uh, uh, traditional way, ways of working for government, so command and control operations, narrow specializations, in work looking cultures, uh, resistance to change, and lack of collaboration. So typically these are, this is a, a set of challenges to pursue the, the organizational and transformation through technology. And again, this focus has its limitations, because really, if we are moving to higher service maturity through more organizational change, this may not lead to more usage of services. You know, the, the usage is, is essential, as we, we've heard from the minister in the opening. Um, the the uh, insufficient public consultation is a source of failure, so just internal transformation does not suffice. Uh, the, the purpose of internal transformation really has to be defined outside government. So the purpose is, is really external performance, measured, well, typically from outside government rather than just purely from uh, inside the, the government perspective. And again, organizational change alone does not create public value. So again, we are moving on to extend the focus into, into more developmental issues, going really out uh, outside the government boundaries and talk about the societal, economic, environmental issues. So goals include how to ensure that electronic public services are actually used by citizens. How to engage non-state actors in the pursuit of public uh, policy and public goals. Arguably, the, 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 there is not enough capacity within government to pursue many of the complex public vo goals. How can governance through networks, so this engagement of government with the non-state actors, be uh, support the, the pursuit of major policy objectives, and the bottom line, how to make sure that government investment into ICT produces public value. Um, a number of challenges, a uh, foremost lack of trust. So this engagement of the, of the stakeholders, of citizens, businesses in the governance networks will face the deficit of trust on both sides. Citizens do not trust in the government and government does not, do not, governments do not trust in their citizens. The, the determining the impact, the actual impact of uh, technology on development is still an unresolved issue. We, we really don't know how to measure, uh, for instance, the, the MDG-8, the Global Partnership for Development. Uh, we still don't know how to actually apply reliable measures to how the, what progress we're making in investing into technology. Uh, there is, of course, a, 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 an issue of managing conflicts and balancing contradictory requirements, given the, the space of uh, stakeholders and then measuring public value in, in complex non-financial terms is, 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 com is difficult. So th this has been kind of the, the, the context for electronic governance and how, what are the dimensions, definitions, and how the focus has changed over time. I just will show two brief examples looking again at, the, at this uh, picture of technology, pressures on government innovation and paradigms. This is an example from the EU. Um, uh, declaration of ministers, ICT ministers, EU ICT ministers from Malmö from uh, 2010, 
uh, mobile government is uh, one of the uh, strategies strongly pursued in this declaration. Of course, this requires uh, innovations uh, still in the declaration. There is a mention of reuse of public information, seamless uh, mobile services, and in turn, this requires a certain uh, set of technological technology development, Web 2.0, pervasive broadband, global digital identity. Okay, now I, I just like to take um, maybe three minutes to kind of uh, uh, pose a question to the audience. I hope you will be interested to, uh, to contribute to, to, to possible answers. How is technology applied in your organization to address the external pressures? And what innovations emerge as a result? How is technology applied in your organization to address uh, external pressures on it and what kind of innovations uh, you uh, have seen emerging in response to such pressures. I wonder if there is any, if somebody would have any comment, any possible short, short answer, a case, please. Yes, thank you. Political behavior online, yes? Only Not only political. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Personal uh, lifestyle mm -hmm. may be changing due to this involvement, uh, which uh, has to be stated. Not mm -hmm. just one mm -hmm. off, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, stated mm -hmm. in the political process mm -hmm. with uh, mm -hmm. concrete mm -hmm. examples and concrete mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. And what is the external pressure that, to what external pressure you respond with? to give people a voice in, in decision-making processes that directly uh, affects their lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, very short, please. Yes? Inside government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Inside government. So mm -hmm. they have used integrated from just applying the software mm -hmm. and after working with other consultants, mm -hmm. finally they understood that the organizational internal organizational mm -hmm. change was needed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this will be changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. There will be um, 
uh, two more points in, in this tutorial where, where you, I will uh, request your contributions. Thank you very much um, uh, for this. Let me move on. Um, the, the, after introducing the, the concept of electronic governance, I just like now to uh, consider what the concept means for development. In, in what sense uh, we can realize, we can help the pursuit of development goals using electronic governance. So ego for D. So um, by development, uh, I mean there are various definitions and schools of thought here. We mean the economic, social, political development in the countries of what we call Global South. So Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, Pacific. Development uh, is defined across various dimensions, the economic dimension, so the creation of wealth and improved conditions of uh, material life, social dimension, so well-being in health, education, housing, and employment, political dim dimension, human rights, political freedoms, cultural dimension, values, beliefs, self-identity of the people, and environmental di dimension, commitment to ecologically sound, uh, sustainable development. Uh, again, various uh, uh, goals, frameworks of objectives have been defined on the national level and international level to measure the progress toward development. And of course, the best known is the framework of Millennium Development goals by, by United Nations. We are approaching the, um, the, the review point in, in 2015, where, the, where we are supposed to actually meet those goals and the targets. But overall, we can say that the, the results of development have been disappointing, if not an utter failure except for a small number of countries, mainly in East Asia. Uh, Republic of Korea, for instance, is, is an example. And the three key reasons for development failure has been inappropriate policy choices, poorly performing public sector, and changing trends in development administration. So, for instance, whether government should do this, all of this, or it should rely on the private sector to do it, or, or just somewhere in between, just for example. So the governance failure, the failure of, of, the, of the state organizations, of, uh, of the public sector, uh, has been a, a strong reason for the development uh, uh, challenges. Yes? So the role of government for development is formulating and implementing jointly with the private sector and civil society the development policies to generate economic growth, provide education, maintain security, expand jobs, etc. The failures of governance are typically uh, attributed to excessive use of regulations and formal rules, poor communication between agency, centralization of decision making, a large distance between public servants and citizens, orientation on maintenance rather than outcomes, inefficiency, unresponsiveness, administrative corruption, and gender bias. And, and in response to these failures, uh, um, many governments have uh, commenced, implemented public sector reform uh, to eliminate red tape, decentralize and devolve the authority, improve responsiveness to citizens, engage the public in decision making and policy making, developing human capacity in government, introducing clear performance and uh, measures and accountability frameworks, delivering public services by, by non-public entities, and utilizing ICT in, in all aspects of the reform. So this is particular where we are interested in, and ICT has been used not just to support the governance of the development process, but for the development objectives uh, uh, themselves. So um, here, I, ICT for D, we mean by this the, the, the application of ICT so, to social economic development. This can be the direct to benefit people or indirect to assist governments and NGOs to improve socio-economic conditions. I mean, whatever is the, whether it's direct or indirect, we can find specific ways um, through which ICT can actually help uh, achieve development. So just some examples, looking at the, at the MDGs for, for poverty, increasing market access and competitiveness of the poor, for education, increasing access to quality education through distance learning, for, for gender, increasing economic and job opportunities for women, for health, connecting rural health providers, informal, with the formal health system, environment, monitoring and risk mitigation, partnership, 
good governance, pursuing the, the, the principles of good governance. Uh, Maria will talk about this in, um, in her presentation. So by electronic governance for development, we mean the, the EGOF, so the transformation of the working of public administrations and how they relate to citizens on development-related objectives. This includes the enhancing the capacity of agencies for public service delivery through the process of ICT-enabled reform and decentralization, using ICT to support the delivery of accessible and affordable services that are most needed by the poor and small businesses, enabling through ICT increased participation of disadvantaged groups in policy decision-making, especially in the matters that concern their lives, etc., as well as support for the governance of the development process. So we are not restricting EGOV to only supporting the governance of development, but we, we seek ways to support the development objectives directly. The governance, on the other hand, is the management of the development process through a framework of rules and institutions to regulate the conduct of all actors involved, whether public or non-public. But we are not restricting ourselves only to supporting governance. So this is a, a, a kind of um, conceptualization, a picture of uh, how we can uh, view ego for D. Uh, you have the, 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 the government hierarchy on the left. You have the various non-government, non-state actors, academia, private sector, civil society on the right. They are connected into a governance network within government between different functions and levels of government and across the sectors. The government undergoes certain transformations, internal uh, transformations, um, and the, the whole network works in the framework of certain objectives, certain development goals, like MDGs. So, and it works together to create impact, to create concrete benefits to citizens, to businesses, to agencies, to communities, to help them pursue whatever is important to them. I guess citizens want happiness and businesses want pursue money, agencies mission, communities relationships. I mean, whatever way we, we, we see the, 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 the pursuit of uh, individual objectives, as well as strengthening the overall socio-economic environment. It's a, it's a big picture of how we can view uh, ego for d and what will be the role of governance network in, um, in such um, uh, the, a pursuit. Uh, here is a, a brief, uh, a short example from Cameroon. We just finished a project to develop the national, a national uh, electronic government strategy and program for electronic government. The strategy is located in the policy context uh, to support the public sector reform and the national ICT policy and directly the growth and employment strategy, which itself and all of them are contributing to the national development vision 2035. So the, the policy context, clearly any activity with this kind of relationship is ego for d because the development needs come very explicitly from, from the policy context that, uh, that we try to uh, pursue. Some lessons learned from such a project, just uh, from the field, I would say. Lower levels of government are always low priority. So national agencies prefer to invest at the central level for visibility, and this creates increasing divide within countries between the central and local level. Fragmented stewardship, EGOF development rests with IT agencies, but implement government collaboration as very uh, important element in the sustainability of EGOF for D programs, engaging local academia in research, education, training, uh, significantly improves program sustainability. Um, and the lesson that bureaucracy is pervasive. So uh, in our case, we have uh, seen how authorizations are required for every action in such projects. So project managers really cannot decide on the basic activities and progress is only assured with the direct engagement of the agency heads. Yeah? So this is a, a peculiar experience from an ego for, for the project. Okay. Uh, discussion we, we covered, so I'd like to move on straight now to sustainable development. So I explained the concept of electronic governance um, and the, the same context uh, concept in 
a development context and I'd like to now explain what we mean by ego for, for SD. So um, the, the famous uh, Brutlund's report defines uh, develop, sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this definition puts forward two essential concepts of needs, um, which are essential needs of the world's poor uh, and limitations. So these are limitations imposed by the current state of technology and social organization on the environment's ability to meet our needs now and in the future. Now, this is a very broad definition and, and usually it's not applied directly. It has to be interpreted. It has to be localized. So the process of doing this is usually to explore the dependencies between various SD principles in various, uh, in different decision-making situations. The, the principles include poverty alleviation, environmental policy integration, inter- and intra-generational e equity, public participation in policy and decision-making, and technological and environmental limits to growth. So, so the usually the, the, the SD definition is operationalized by looking at the local context and looking at the balance of the SD principles and what they mean for us in a given context. Now, uh, like development, SD is a process, it's a transition. A transition that is not just internal to the government, it's a transition of the society as a whole, of the way we are relating to each other and to our environment. So as a process, the governance of this process is, is of, of primary importance. Okay, okay, thank you very much. You, I, the, the, the fourth dimension, the, the, the transition, sustainability transition, talks about integration, about policy integration, um, and there are various approaches to, to seek this integration, whether, well, Maria will talk about policy development, but alignment is typically also a way that we seek over time how the, the, the two, the different programs are kind of, can, kind of converge, yes? And how we can reach a balance between the level of, say, uh, economic and the social development, environmental uh, um, issues, etc. Yes? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And politically, I'm trying to say to another speaker. Yes. I'm, I'm very yes. trying to speak here that we never converge. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, I have a little different uh, experience in this regard. I'm. Mm -hmm. uh, we are working in the model watershed project. Mm -hmm. So there, we are successful in uh, bringing all the government schemes together in form of a convergence, mm -hmm. like social forestry department, irrigation department, and many other departments which are headed by the district magistrate. Mm -hmm. We brought all the people over there, and we did a lot of things for the sustainable development of those mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. who are living in those villages mm -hmm. where our watershed development mm -hmm. project mm -hmm. is going okay. on. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me let me move on. Um, I'd like to just uh, step back a little bit to um, uh, to at least show you um, how we are mapping these two domains, eGov and sustainable development. Yes. So if we ta take the the goals of um, this is not the one. Um, okay. So um, the, the the goals for for environmental, economic, social sustainability, and sustainability transition. I explained them already. And here is a, a kind of big picture conceptualization where we consider SD as a balance between social, environmental, and economical concerns. There may be more. Culture is typically uh, mentioned as the fourth dimension. And how we are applying EGOV, which by itself is positioned at the intersection of political, administrative system and civil society to result in ego for SD, which is how ICT supports the governance and also the fulfillment directly of sustainable development goals. So that's a kind of conceptualization of how we understand these domains of SD and ego to converge into ego for SD. But I will do a little bit more precise mapping on the next slides. Yes? So let's look at at social sustainability. The concept has been set up for electronic governance for sustainable development and what does it mean if we apply this to various sus uh, sustainability goals. 
So how can, the question is, how can EGOF initiatives explicitly address the social sustainability goal? Okay? So we're looking at EGOF dimensions, government, technology, interaction, customers, society, and we look at the SD goals, particularly at social sustainability. We elaborate these goals into objectives. This is just some of the objectives, like access for all, reducing poverty and inequality, reducing gender inequality, reducing infant and uh, maternal uh, mortality. And we're looking at how the various EGOF dimensions can actually make a positive contribution on these objectives. For instance, technology and access for all. Uh, EGOF technology initiatives should consider accessibility issues. So the issues of cost, ability to use, ability to benefit, of all segments of the society in their technology choices. For instance, and Joanna will know a lot about this, the support for mobile channels for service delivery. Okay, Joanna has done uh, a study of the, of the headporters, of the impact of, of possessing a mobile phones for the headporters in Ghana. Okay, that's, that's an example, a concrete initiative, concrete instance of how mobile technology can help. If we look at just one more a dependency maybe uh, uh, from the technology enabled information and services to reducing poverty and inequality, which is B, we're looking at the measure where EGOF services enable citizens and particularly the disadvantaged groups to meet their critical livelihood needs like uh, access to jobs, like primary health services, like educational services, uh, sanitation, etc. Okay? Now, now, this is um, actually what you see here are highlights from national e-government strategies for Singapore, for Korea, for Estonia, for European Union, and also highlights from the most recent e-government benchmark instruments like United Nations e-government survey and Waseda University survey. These are just highlights. But here I put in color those of the strategy highlights that refer to social sustainability like ele electronic health records from Singapore, like improvements of services to cater for different needs from EU, like involvement of stakeholders in public policy process, like citizen-centric practice, traceability of the use of one's own data. This is what the president talked about in his, in his keynote uh, just last hour. Internet in rural areas, increase of social media applications for participation. So we see that the, the, in, the, in the practice uh, the, and strategic development of e-government around the world, we do see how uh, sustainability issues are being tackled directly. Here is just a concrete example of the sustainable social services in the UK, uh, which is a kind of framework for, for action in Wales um, uh, to... Uh, uh, focus on citizen-centered services, integrated services, reducing complexity, and safeguarding and promoting the well-being of citizens. It's a framework for action addressing uh, uh, directly uh, social sustainability issues. The next uh, goal, environmental sustainability. Um, here we're asking the question, how can EGOF initiatives explicitly, uh, explicitly address the environmental sustainability goal. And again, we are expanding the environmental sustainability goal into objectives like climate change, improved um, uh, water management, reduced land uh, uh, degradation, and the restoration of biodiversity. And we're looking at the opportunities that EGOF dimensions create for the fulfillment of those goals. For instance, um, how uh, technology can help uh, in climate change, A. So we use at the u we look at the use of low or zero carbon emission ICT equipment for government operations, both front and back office. Or uh, if we look at the uh, improved water management uh, through technology-enabled services, so C, um, providing information and services to citizens and businesses on better domestic water management practice and smart metering systems. Okay, so uh, uh, we, we have some concrete measures that EGOF can help in this totally 
uh, non-technological areas and non-technological techno objectives. When we again look at the highlights from the national strategies, then several of them directly refer to the goal of environmental sustainability. For instance, EU uh, highlights the uh, reductions in, in carbon footprint, Estonia, paperless document management, Waseda, cloud computing, and data center virtualization. So cloud computing is a measure that we can apply to seek environmental sustainability and smart grid and green technology. Here is a, a concrete example, an initiative from the Maldives, uh, uh, crowdsourcing the renewable uh, energy strategy. Um, the, the aim of this is to invite experts from around the world to provide technical advice on low carbon energy generation, storage and financing. Um, the objective being to make the country carbon neutral by 2020 and to address the lack of local technical expertise. So a, a number of uh, themes and questions are being addressed and the, and the experts are invited to contribute to them. It's like crowdsourcing the, the national strategy development. Looking at the next goal, in, uh, economic sustainability, uh, we uh, pursue the, uh, we look at how EGOF initiatives can address the economic sustainability goals. Uh, this is here expanded into, into three objectives, transportation, logistics, economic growth, and improve energy consumption. And again, we are looking at the opportunities offered by different dimensions, EGOF dimensions, to these, to the fulfillment of these objectives. For instance, uh, in what sense technology infrastructure can uh, help the improvements in energy consumption um, by the use of energy efficient technology equipment in government operations and incorporation of such equipment in the government procurement practice. Okay, that's, uh, that's two examples. Uh, uh, another one, um, transportation and logistics, how the uh, technology enabled services can uh, help uh, transportation and logistics objective, uh, which is B, providing information and services to citizens to help reduce uh, transport uh, congestion. For instance, real time service to check traffic situations in different uh, parts of cities. Okay, so a, a way of, of trying to map the, for each of these uh, uh, concrete measures, of course there are many examples around the world to actually illustrate how they are uh, being, uh, how they are operationalized. Looking at the national strategies, several of them refer to economic sustainability from Singapore, innovation centers and entrepreneurship, from Korea, public-private collaborative governance, from Estonia, uh, one service space, mm, putting together public, private and voluntary sector services into one space and from EU inviting third parties uh, in EGOV development. Here is a, a concrete initiative from by the California state government to provide green occupational guidelines to 23 different occupations. So uh, uh, the, the, the guidelines, the terms of reference for certain positions and how they can uh, um, uh, be useful in pursuing economic sustainability. And the last dimension, the last goal is sustainability transition. Um, here we look at how EGOF initiatives can address the, sustain uh, the sustainability transition goal, um, uh, including the goals of adoption of green accounting, access to underprivileged groups, adoption of environmentally friendly pr technologies and practices, and generation of energy from re renewable sources. Uh, we have only one measure applied here on technology-enabled services, and this is to provide information and services that show key sustainability indicators and how they can interpret in our daily life or in the decision-making by businesses. So here you see a system of indicators for sustainability like social, population density, growth rate, life expectancy, infant mortality, economic indicators, air travel, energy consumption, growth of economic activities, 
environmental indicators, biodiversity, animal population, uh, depletion of fossil fuels, or transitional indicators like changes in food and nutrition styles, uh, environmental and general education, percentage of energy uh, generated from re renewable sources. So providing um, uh, electronic services and information that can help people and businesses decide which channels to use to reduce the, the, the impact on and to help sustainability transition. So here are some examples from the highlights from the national strategies that directly address the sustainability transition goal like active response to adverse effects of informatization from Korea like internet addiction, like access to indecent content by children, like identity theft. Um, uh, from, e, uh, from UN, agility to respond to more demands from services as revenues, government revenues drop and therefore investment into ICT. And from Waseda, disaster management and business continuity. So here is just a, a concrete example from UK, direct Gov uh, portal offering information services on environment and green living. So recycling and reducing waste, uh, energy saving, greener home, greener travel, um, uh, greener community and work, greener life events and celebrations. Yes, uh, across different categories. Uh, what difference can we make uh, with the choices uh, that uh, we decide? We had this already, and uh, I reached the end uh, with uh, uh, less time for Maria. Apologies for this. So, um, so what I introduced so far is the concept of electronic government and what this concept means for development and for sustainable development. This is just one understanding, uh, but it has been done by systematically looking at the two domains looking at the dimensions of these domains and trying to relate them together. And of course, it's not symmetrical. We, we seek eGov as, as a tool for sustainable development, not the other way around. Yes? So the, the, this mapping has been defined in a fairly systematic way and with the concrete instances of uh, how this is uh, uh, pursued um, around the world. So now I, um, we will look at how the eGov 4SD concept can be realized particularly uh, through open government and policy development, how we can involve stakeholders in the policy development process. And this part will be taught by, by Maria Wim Wimmer. Uh, we, I'm not sure whether we will have time for questions, but in any case, we are open. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, afterwards also um, uh, offline. Hmm? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, just, just in case, okay. just in case, yes. Would you mind switching your slides? Uh, I think I have my PowerPoint up here. So are there questions already for Thomas' presentation, sustainable development? Okay. So, let's see how this uh, works. Yeah, um, thank you very much to Thomas for the very good introduction to set up the ground uh, for uh, eGov for sustainable development. Um, my presentation, as he uh, already mentioned, will focus now particularly on a project where we have uh, developed a concept uh, for policy development using uh, stakeholder-oriented scenario development as a means to engage stakeholders in the policy development process. Before I introduce you to this uh, concept of um, this project, I actually want to come back uh, with some reflections on uh, what Thomas has said and uh, uh, trying to 
sum up a common understanding of open government and policy development, policy making also. Now, um, when Thomas presented these different aspects uh, that form up uh, electronic governance, we already recognize we have organizational aspects, uh, the institutional dimension, we have technology dimension, we have the people dimension, we have of course the process dimension and the content that we want to deal with. And all this together create a very complex socio-economic, socio-technical environment. And um, my background is uh, from computer science. So what we are trying there usually is uh, to systematize and to simplify these aspects in order to make them manageable. Complexity science is uh, one of the areas that uh, has a huge contribution to give in this domain in order to understand the different impact factors, uh, imp impacting aspects that relate to each other when we talk about um, this kind of sustainable development. When we talk about a, a policy, it's the same. It's not just a st strategic document that is out there that somebody has uh, set up and then everybody's following. It's uh, a complex process to come to such common conclusions. And uh, it's not only the policy document out there. It is also the question of, well, how can this materialize in the end? How can we really bring it out there? It's not uh, that somebody at the top level of government decides a policy and then it's done. It's not done, actually. We see in many cases that policies fail or do not reach the objectives to that uh, sophistication as we want. And very often uh, the, the, the problem is that we didn't foresee the complexity, but also that we didn't foresee uh, the engagement of stakeholders, that we didn't ask the stakeholders whether they wanted, and we didn't see the value, public value, as uh, Thomas mentioned before. Now, we have to deal with all these factors in our 21st century uh, environment and uh, era. And uh, this brings me to the point where we have to reflect a concept. Uh, he mentioned it before, Thomas, already. Um, good governance. It's not a new concept. It's actually a concept that uh, emerged in the 80s, late last century. The good governance principles. What do they mean? Basically, and this is uh, uh, an understanding taken from the European uh, Commission's uh, document, a communication document, good governance principles refer to the approaches and guidelines for good governance and public administration to promote the interaction and the formation of political will with the regard to soci societal and technological change. This was specially set up also with the realm of uh, information society development. And there are several good governance uh, definitions, not only the one from the EC, which covers five principles, namely openness, participation, transparency, accountability, effectiveness, and coherence. Openness referring to involving people, stakeholders, in political decision-making letting people understand, giving them access to information, uh, giving them access to understand how decisions have been made. Participation, referring to going one step further from openness. People can participate in political decision making or in uh, public service delivery, engaging the people in shaping up uh, society and uh, governance accountability, that the political level and the government level is a can be held accountable for what they are doing, for the promises they give uh, during election periods and uh, the services that are being provided later on and that uh, these uh, actions are being accountable. Effectiveness, that the money spent for providing these services and for establishing uh, forward-looking policies is spent well, that it's uh, effectively uh, uh, put in place, that there is public value out of uh, investments and of uh, service delivery. And coherence, that the, the uh, goals that are set are really 
reached and the actions uh, correspond to the policy uh, objectives. And that there is a coherent way of uh, interaction. There are, as I said, uh, uh, several public uh, policy good governance principles uh, set out. And another one is uh, from an OECD study. You see this is already from 2003, basically. Uh, the one point that I want to add here is uh, transparency, because uh, in the EC, uh, transparency is not uh, directly mentioned, but it is encompassed in the objectives. However, it plays a very important role for in order to ensure trust in government and trust in this people, as uh, it was also in the slides of Thomas. Uh, transparency is the means to, to ensure trust. Reliable, relevant and timely information has to be provided on both sides to people uh, for policy development, but also um, to government people to uh, make the right decisions. And we look around uh, at uh, current uh, political streams. There are so many cases where uh, transparency is uh, the challenge to be addressed, where, where transparency or the lack of transparency hampers actual uh, decisions. Uh, just giving an example from Germany, um, there is this uh, Stuttgart 21 project uh, where in the Stuttgart uh, city a big uh, new train station should be built. And decisions were made nearly 10 years ago for this investment. And one, it's n nearly one year ago approximately, I think it started in October, People uh, have been informed that this uh, reconstruction will start and uh, the bulldozer should come uh, to uh, uh, bring down some uh, walls. And then people started to reflect, well, what, do, what the hell are they doing there? And they went on the street and protest and they stopped this project. It's a huge investment from the German trains, the uh, state of uh, um, Baden-Württemberg and the city of Stuttgart. And for a year now, everything has stopped because people did not understand uh, what was going on. They didn't understand what the, the budget plans were there, and they were not involved uh, directly in decision making. But people uh, do not want uh, just to trust anymore in government. They want to have a say. They want to understand. They want to have trust and uh, transparency in such decision makings. This is just a wonderful example from Germany now. But uh, such uh, there are so many examples in the last uh, few years emerging that uh, evidence that people want to be involved uh, when it comes to decisions that have an impact on their uh, social life, uh, well-being, economic environment, and so on. So also in sustainable development, it is so important to involve uh, the grassroots people, to involve those to which uh, uh, an objective uh, should be uh, reached, those uh, where impact should be achieved, value should be created. And uh, if uh, we go further, um, the OECD has published a study in 2009 focused on citizens, which uh, stresses once again uh, the involvement, uh, the engagement of people in better policy making. And they say that the open and inclusive policy making offers one way of improving policy uh, performance and meeting citizens' rising expectations. Public engagement in the design and delivery of public policy and services can help governments better understand people's needs, leverage a wider pool of information and resources, improve compliance, constrain costs, and reduce the risks of conflict and delays downstream. So open policy development is key in nowadays uh, strategic uh, long-term planning policy development. And uh, that means that uh, by open policy development, we can reach transparency, accountability, public participation, and we can build capacity at the grassroots. <coughs> <coughs> and this is the objectives that were mentioned just before with the good governance principles. 
And it, move, uh, it offers also a way for governments to improve the policy performance through working with the citizens and the civil uh, society organizations, businesses and other stakeholders to deliver concrete improvements in policy outcomes and quality of public services. Now, we have talked a lot about uh, policy now. We have heard before some examples of a strategic development. But uh, what really do we understand by a policy? Can we get some examples from your side about policies? I think there were some uh, examples before already, but let's uh, dig into it once again. Some examples of a uh, public policy. Which ones do you have in your environment? Have you been involved in developing such a policy? What makes up a policy? Any ideas? When we talk about the policy, what is meant with it? Yes, please. I think there are many interpretations about what policy stands for the domain. Yeah. And policy is applied for. But I guess from my uh, background, where I'm in Germany, and we are developing policies uh, for many tracks, we have couple of policies for IT policies, we have security policies, we have mm -hmm. enterprise mm -hmm. architecture policies, yeah. we have internet usage policy, yeah. and I guess there are many policies, but we uh, intend to build a policy framework to maintain the discipline mm -hmm. for organization and people to adhere with. This is the, mm -hmm. the objective. Mm -hmm. But I give that many examples of policies. I mean, yeah. one of the major examples of policies we have what's called enterprise <coughs> architecture policies, <coughs> how government entities mm -hmm. should be collaborate together mm -hmm. in order to follow a disciplined way to adopt a government uh, initiatives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're referring to one particular understanding of uh, policy. Um, and when we talk about uh, public governance, uh, we we broaden the understanding like, uh, for example, um, to develop uh, and set up visions uh, for um, where we want to reach at, let's say in five years, for example, and how we can achieve that. So a policy, for example, for uh, introducing renewable energy in an environment. That was one of the aspects that uh, was also mentioned before in the project that um, I will be introducing, we have a, a, a case um, uh, where it's um, from Slovakia, the uh, Kosice region, which is close to the border to Ukraine. It is dependent very much on uh, gas import from Ukraine and the policy that they want to develop is, well, how can we get out of this uh, uh, dependency uh, by not only uh, reducing this dependency, but also increasing uh, the uh, production of uh, renewable energy, green energy, because that's also in line with uh, wider policies. But also, how can we um, educate people that they uh, don't uh, waste the energy consumption, so that they really uh, use energy uh, in an effective way and efficient way. It's just a different uh, case of uh, a policy, public policy. Uh, and another area of uh, public policy would be uh, structural funds from the European Union. Uh, structural funds um, investments are uh, to support uh, uh, regions uh, which uh, need uh, further investment in uh, structural development. Uh, to, to help them uh, and develop their uh, uh, infrastructure, economic growth and things like that. And then the question is, uh, locally, well, where to best spend the money? It's not only that, uh, well, you have the money, uh, there must be reasons and there must be well thought through plans for investments so that impact is in the end achieved. There must always be a long-term goal for policy development. And this is just another case uh, where uh, the, the project will uh, investigate policy development. What we have to uh, recognize here in this context is that public engagement is a sine qua non in our uh, nowadays environment for effective public governance. And there are two stakes that we have to consider here. 
The one is the government stake. Governments cannot alone deal with complex global and domestic challenges, such as climate change uh, or um, uh, the energy production, the energy consumption, like uh, the, uh, the Koshitsa case. It's also uh, one of the cases where the citizens need to be um, informed and trained, capacity building on uh, how to best spend and in most effective way spend uh, uh, energy heating uh, in order to reduce their costs, but also in order to uh, uh, spend uh, the energy in a, a green style, um, so to, to become more uh, environmental uh, uh, oriented, thinking about uh, what impact um, different uh, energy produ producing systems have and if you waste too much energy, what uh, impact that has in long run on uh, the climate and uh, the whole climate change is uh, a wider impact that we have to, to see in this respect. Governments also have to face hard trade-offs such as uh, responding to rising demands for better quality of public services despite, uh, despite tight budgets. And uh, they need to work with the citizens and other stakeholders to find solutions. And the other stake is the citizen stake. As I said before, they are more educated, well informed and less uh, differential now in order to judge their governments on democratic performance and policy performance. Democratic performance so that they are being involved in the policy decision making uh, and that uh, these decisions are transparent. And policy performance that the policy settled are really reached, that there is an impact reached and people want to know about this. They want to be involved in this more and more. And technology provides uh, uh, information society is a means that can provide it. Now before going into uh, further uh, details and uh, introducing the project, I want to discuss a little bit with you what do you see of uh, the, the main challenges currently in collaborative policy development? Yes, please. Citizens do not really want to cooperate and they don't want to participate. Uh, why do you think this is a challenge? And well why do you think it is so? Well, I, I think I have many, many ideas on why that is so. I think the challenge is um, that if, if government is trying to get, for instance, feedback on a policy proposal mm -hmm. and the feedback remains unanswered by citizens or you only hear from one segment of the citizenship, then you're, n you're not really getting a full um, area or you know full um, representation of what the public is thinking. Mm -hmm. So then you have a problem of are you only hearing from the people or from the you know the extremes uh, yeah. of the sides? Yeah. You're not really hearing from the center. Um, and I think the reason is um, citizens often don't want to be bothered. I mean, I think okay, certainly this is a very valid uh, observation, but I would actually hold something against it. And uh, if, w if we consider some of the evolutions in, in the recent past over the last year, we see that actually citizens do want to get involved. Not everybody, certainly. And uh, um, certainly there are also different means uh, of engaging people. If it is a, there are study act studies actually which are evidence. If it is a, a policy that is that far away, I fully agree with you. But I if it's something which I'm locally concerned with, I want to have a say. I, I totally agree with you because when, when I'm looking at different um, uh, experiments mm -hmm. in, in the United States, if you see the federal, at the federal government level, yeah. which you know, eventually trickles down to the citizen, you yeah. see fairly low engagement levels. Yeah. But if it's a you know, building of you know, a garbage dump behind my house, well, I'm going to participate. So you definitely see, see the difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is uh, one of the ways where we have to go. We cannot just generalize uh, and say, well, s the e-participation projects have evidence citizens don't want to engage. We have to uh, um, segregate them and say, well, 
this is a policy that concerns, concerns certain stakeholders, certain types of citizens in the region that may be geographically um, uh, grouped, they may be topic widely uh, grouped and so on. So and then uh, uh, different ways of conceptualizing the projects have to be done. So there's another point in the back. Thank you. I would mention three things, and I guess the first is that quite often um, in the heads of, of citizens and in the heads of people, the, the terms policy making and politics get confused. And, and often people think, I don't want to be associated to any political party. Mm -hmm. And then they think that automatically applies also to be a member or, or be, a part, uh, be a part in mm -hmm. public policy making. Mm -hmm. So I think there, there, that's an area <laughs> where a lot of work can be done, es especially by civil society organizations, mm -hmm. explaining the difference between politics and policy making. Um, but then uh, there are two other issues that I wouldn't say that they are risky challenges, but I, I think that that's what I see emerging is um, one I would call is a, is a rise of single issues. Um, the nonprofit organizations have fought hard in the last you know 20 years, both both international as well as, as nationally, in putting certain topics um, in the agenda, in the political agenda. And while doing so, they have negotiated relatively good concepts of you know, codes of good practice, participatory lawmaking, so mm -hmm. on. So they have gained certain ground. And now with the increase of social media, it allows individuals or groups of individuals to have um, you know, regular citizens just forming around them and rising for a certain issue without a long agenda, without a long policymaking tradition. Mm -hmm. And what I see in the nonprofit world happening is actually bothers a lot of civil society organizations. They feel that they're losing the ground not to the government, not to the business, but to their own members and to their own yeah. citizens. Yeah. Because they become so institutionalized, a lot of, a lot of us or a lot of them, mm. and that, that kind of individual at approach to solve an immediate issue in my neighborhood or in my mm. local government is, is a one fantastic opportunity, but not necessarily for civil society organizations. Mm. And the third um, that I see as a challenge is the kind of proof of evidence thing, is, um, is that collaborative policy development also means that um, either both parties or all parties involved, I guess that would be more appropriate to say, need to be not simply professional enough on equal terms, but also mm. need to have access to the same kind of data. And whereas in some countries we have a lot of open data, so either as a non-profit organization or as a government agency, we can operate with the same data. It doesn't mm. apply necessarily mm. in all the other countries, and yeah. the proof of evidence is used quite often mm. against non-profits, against collaborative policy development, saying yeah. you have no idea what you're talking yeah. about. So yeah. these are my Please yeah, yeah. Thank Thanks. you. I think you're raising also quite uh, important issues. And uh, for the, the last point, actually, uh, providing access to information is really crucial. And uh, also here we have to uh, separate uh, how much information is uh, to be given to, to whom and how you present the information, actually. It's not that the citizens will have the time to read all the text they won't have. Uh, but um, there is... Uh, uh, an issue where we um, will talk here in, in the project where we can use technology to help us uh, sort out extracting the, the valuable information and then help us visualize the relationships, uh, the, the interdependencies among different information aspects that have uh, an impact uh, to coming up to a certain decision. And uh, to the aspect of um, well, uh, civil society organization losing grounds um, because people are uh, organizing themselves or chaotically engaging themselves through social media. This is also um, an aspect where I think uh, we will have to reflect further, which goes very much into transitional development, sustainable development. Because, uh, well, um, you do very often, in a way, express uh, a point where you, you are just now engaged. You do not want to follow strict and rigid policy development procedures. And uh, so governments will have to open up uh, and expand their capacity also to engage in this kind of processes and to see what is out there, hearing the constituency from that way of uh, interaction. This is just another channel, but it's a channel where uh, the voices can really be heard because the people are there. It's not that the people 
will follow up uh, and uh, will um, just um, engage when the government will say. They will want to have their own say and they will use the means available. Now, let's uh, have a look at the Yokopomo project. I, I will try to uh, hurry up a little bit because we I think we're a little bit uh, beyond time. We have uh, addressed current challenges in policy making mostly. We have already discussed about the complexity management and uh, yeah, most of this has been said, so I will not uh, dig into it further. Th one of the, the key problems that we faced when we um, um, developed this proposal was that we recognize when we talk about policy modeling, and now I'm talking about um, uh, policy modeling in terms of uh, um, the policy advices to governments uh, for policy development like a renewable energy policy to be developed, information society uh, policy to, to be developed, sustainable development policy to be developed, and so on. Usually, um, the policy advisors, they have tools available and they use tools uh, for uh, predictions, for um, assessment of alternatives, but these tools are not really accessible to the, the broad uh, constituency to different stakeholders. It's something where these policy advisors are experts and even the politicians usually do not understand the econometric models behind the uh, um, uh, economic uh, calculations behind certain simulations, but such tools are being used. And now uh, this is where the Okopomo project comes in. The project uh, as such uh, aims at uh, supporting key stakeholders to participate in such uh, processes of policy formulation. When we talk about uh, key stakeholders, we mean uh, what we said before, it's not the general public as such, but really the groups that are concerned with the topic, like uh, in the Koshitsa case, in terms of renewable energy, it's a uh, household, it's, it's flat, flat owners, it's uh, producers of uh, renewable energy, it's the regional government and uh, the local municipalities, and uh, it's uh, green organizations uh, who uh, want to take care about um, uh, climate uh, protection and so on. So we talk about uh, particular stakeholders, uh, that's why we don't talk about citizen engagement but uh, we use the term stakeholder engagement. We integrate methods and tools for scenario-based policy development uh, and uh, formal policy modeling. I will explain uh, this process uh, in, a, in a minute. And uh, we integrate uh, different tools and provide an integrated ICT platform for supporting this policy development with different means of open collaboration and uh, stakeholder engagement. <coughs> Sorry. Now, first contribution from this project is uh, the integrated policy development process, which involves different actors. I have to say, and uh, responding to what we discussed before, different uh, means of uh, institutionalized policy development processes. We here rely on certain uh, institutional processes because, uh, uh, yeah, in the project scope, uh, this is not possible to change. However, there will be some reflection in the uh, government cases which are involved here. So we start actually from um, the government side which uh, sees uh, the necessity of uh, a new policy or which has put in place uh, um, a policy and wants to monitor it now. A or it's a uh, civil society organizations project, they see the need and want to force governments uh, to uh, come up with a certain policy and commonly develop this. Now we need, in order to engage people, we need a starting point. And the starting point is a narrative scenario, an initial scenario, which is fed with uh, background information to evidence uh, the starting point. And this uh, means here in this, uh, in this initial phase, we have domain experts 
those uh, who want to trigger this uh, policy and who have uh, expert knowledge in it and uh, facilitators to come up with the scenario description in order that uh, uh, in the next phase when we involve the wider stakeholder groups they have a good understanding of the starting point. Now in the 